Hey friends, my name's Roisin and welcome back to my channel. So today it is time for my August reading wrap up since it is now September. Yes, finally, it is autumn time. Uh, and as you can see behind me, I actually have this huge stack of books here because for once I didn't return all my books to the library before I filmed my wrap up and therefore I have to spend my time inserting pictures into my video. So growth, it's only taken me a year and a half to get this far. The other reason why I have a huge stack of books today is because August was actually a really good reading month for me in terms of quantity. I read 15 books this month. 15 books. Uh, I feel like I should have done a mid-month wrap-up but I didn't realise until I was nearly finished this month how many books I had actually read. But I'm actually going to talk to you about 16 books today because uh, the first book I want to talk to you about I haven't actually finished yet but I'm so close to finishing it today, the 1st of September, if I don't wrap it up now I fear I will have forgotten what I liked about it um, because I don't know about you but when I talk about a book on this channel I remember far more about it after I've talked about it than if I don't talk about it, if that makes any sense. Th that book that I liked but haven't finished is Bil Build Your House Around My Body by Violet Cooper Smith. Now I, this was one of my anticipated releases for this year, it came out in July. It is also a book that I partially read in a vlog where I was reading fantasy books by Asian women writers uh, and also travelling to Cornwall and the seaside. So I will leave that vlog in the cards above if you want to go and check it out and I will also be talking about two of the books I read for that later on in this video. This one I haven't quite finished yet. Um, this is set in Vietnam and it is it's about a lot of things actually. Uh, one of the perspectives we have is a woman who goes missing right at the start of the book and then we kind of flash back and forwards in time um, and we find out about her and what led up to her going missing. Her life is interconnected with various different other people. Um, there was also someone who, there was also a tragedy that happened in the 1980s and then we flash even further back into Vietnam's past. This book deals a lot with Vietnamese folklore, a lot of which is wrapped up in ghosts. Vietnamese people very much believe in ghosts um, and so there are a lot of ghosts in this book. Um, which is why, although I thought of it as being like a folklore inspired fantasy novel, having read the majority of it now, I would almost class this as horror. Um, there are definitely some really quite scary aspects of this. I mean, I'm a wimp, uh, so I wouldn't necessarily take my um, description too seriously because I did manage to read it. I haven't found it too scary at any points. But there's definitely some very unsettling, ghostly sort of actions and some sort of weird body horror stuff, um, as well as really, really beautiful, evocative writing. I found myself really drawn into this one and finding it difficult to put down. There is a mystery going throughout here, the way that all of these are connected. Uh, names and people pop up again in different time periods and the mystery of what is the ghost, what is causing all of this ghostly happenings um, that is connected with a rubber forest is really intriguing. I think it's a lot about colonialism, about France's impact on Vietnam and also the Vietnam War. Um, but more than that uh, just a lot of the tragedies um, and I think although I haven't finished it I'm pretty sure there is a sort of feminist aspect to this as well so yeah I really really loved it which for me horror is not a genre that I usually read I didn't pick this up thinking it was horror um, but I would say there is definitely some horror overtones to this and I've really enjoyed them so yeah if you are looking for something that is lyrical beautiful literary horror then maybe this would be up your street so the other books that I've read this month I'm gonna go in order like I normally do. So the first one on my list that I read was The Mothers by Britt Bennett and I read this for a book club, the It's Two Sides book club where we read books by women of colour. I will leave the Twitter and the Instagram linked below because it is an online book club that is looking for new people although everyone in the book club at the moment does know each other I know they are looking for new people to join so if you're interested that will be in the description. But for this month we read The Mothers by Britt Bennett. I also read this for a vlog where I was giving authors that I liked from last year a second chance which again I will leave in the cards above and because I enjoyed The Vanishing Half that is why The Mothers made it onto that list as well. This tells the story of a girl who has recently lost her mother and her relationship with the son of a pastor. This relationship leads to a teen pregnancy and the decision about that pregnancy goes on to affect the lives of everyone in this small town in Southern California which is very much dominated by the church. This book was very similar to The Vanishing Half in terms of the style of writing, although I do feel like Britt Bennett had Im has improved. Um, the Vanishing Half, which she wrote 
after this the mothers was much better written in my personal opinion although it was very similar in terms of being very much character focused really well developed characters um a lot of nuance in terms of the sort of ideas being discussed um and yeah very much an ideas focused work this work revolves around the idea of motherhood and what it is to be a mother which we can gather from the title um also about religion and judgment uh, the way that brit pendant has improved um is that although i did struggle a little with the writing of vanishing half being too on the nose that was much more apparent in the mothers um everything was very much explained out to us and um also the overuse of similes um nothing was able to be described without being said to be as or like something else um, and so that felt a little clunky and heavy-handed to me so this is maybe a spoiler so you can skip um this bit if you want to but uh it happens quite early in the book so i wouldn't necessarily consider it to be a spoiler but i also wasn't sure about the way that this book dealt with abortion um i know that Britt bennett has said that she wanted to fall somewhere between the it's no big deal and it's a sin and how terrible and murder um but i felt like it did stray a little too into a pro-life stance for me personally um everyone involved in the abortion was punished for the abortion in some way um and particularly the girl involved uh and no one at any point spoke positively about the abortion and i don't mean in a oh it was fine but in a it was okay that you did that that was not part of the narrative at all even from the girl herself she never even realized thought of it she never really thought of it herself. They definitely had great atmosphere, great characters, but overall I didn't really love this book. The same book I read, and this is a proof copy, um, but it is Ill Feelings by Alice Hattrick. Um, and I read this because I interviewed Alice for my friend's blog, um, The Hysterical Woman blog, uh, which I will leave again linked in the description, although I don't think that interview has gone live yet. Um, but this is about um, Alice and their experience with chronic fatigue slash ME uh, and also their mother being diagnosed with the same illness and it goes into detail about lots of historical figures and their experience with sort of mysterious undiagnosable illnesses, the link between hysteria and uh, ME CFS and the treatment of it throughout time. Um, I'm not going to really give my personal feelings about this book because I did interview the author. Um, I feel like it's a bit difficult for me to review i don't really know how i feel about that um but i would say that if you like kind of uh lyrical thoughtful memoir um and you want to read more about ill health if you are interested in history of it but sort of a much more personal history than something like unwell women by elena cleghorn then um maybe this would be a book for you especially if you're more interested in the memoir side of it which is something that things like um unwell women and what's the gabrielle jackson one called pain and prejudice both have been marketed as having a memoir aspect but it's very light in the memoir this is much more focused on the personal individual experience of ill health so if that's something you're interested in this might be for you then uh, another book that i don't have a copy of that i listened to the audiobook of was in the woods by tana french and i listened to this because grace from gk reads is doing a dublin murder squad read along kind of book group thing um so i picked it up this is set in ireland as you can guess from the fact it's called the dublin murder squad and it is about a man who is a detective um and he has been called to the scene of a murder of a young girl in a small town in um sort of semi-rural kind of just outside of the suburbs of dublin like further out but it's very close to dublin um and he, it is actually the town he grew up where there had been a tragedy of two children going missing in his past um but nobody he works with knows that he was related to that tragedy um and so he has to investigate this murder with his partner um and the family who have lost a daughter um and try obviously it's a thriller he's coming to find out what happened who did who did it it's a whodunit kind of a murder um this is a very long book but i think it's definitely worth it it's very atmospheric it really builds the feeling of being watched of fear and um paranoia i suppose i think it's very much built into this novel works well at kind of misdirecting you making you unsure who you can trust um and there was also humor and i think the characters are really well developed which is something that is missing from a lot of thrillers but i think that tana french has done well in this book there is a deep development of all of the characters and you can kind of understand them there is humor and warmth um, and you feel for them and as i said she does well at misdirecting you although i wasn't entirely misdirected um i kind of worked out what was going on um or at least 
to some extent worked out what was going on um kind of halfway to two thirds of the way through the novel um but that didn't ruin it for me uh i think that it shows that she's like leaving enough clues for you to be able to work out what's going on with all of the like brilliant atmosphere and the characters i still enjoyed it um so thrillers are still not my favorite genre um but this for a thriller was definitely one of the best that i've read so that i think is high praise so i mentioned earlier the vlog where i was um giving authors a second chance and one of the other writers that i gave a second chance was Jan kalman stephenson and i read his novel fish have no feet last year i read his novel um summer light and then comes the night which was actually written before this although the translation was published after this and that was one of my favorite novels of last year so i gave fish have no feet to go this tells the story of Kefleavik, which is a town in eastern I no west <laughs> west Iceland I think um and it is the blackest town in Iceland because of the volcanic like black sand um and uh it is also a really remote place um and it, it talks about Ari who is our main character and he has kind of gone through a midlife crisis and left to work in Copenhagen for a while and is now coming back um, and we know that he left his wife at this point but he's coming back now and it also flashes back through Ari's family history through his family tree um, so we see his grandfather and his grandmother um, and their love story and we also see uh, his aunts and uncles um, and different members of his family and of this small town of Keflavik where he grew up not a lot happens in this book it is not definitely not a plot based novel it is much more um ideas focused i would say because although there are a lot of characters in this i don't feel that we get a huge build up of their personalities because they all represent something um not literally like they're not like archetypes but they are being used to tell the story um this book is incredibly beautifully written um i love the way that uh stephenson writes i and the way that um the translator philip Broughton has translated it um i can't say how much is due to what because obviously i don't read icelandic um but i really really enjoy the kind of off kilter way that it is written the really strange metaphors um and the way that he builds up again atmosphere the feeling of being in iceland this small isolated community i think he does that excellently um but what i would say is that this didn't have the whimsy of summer light comes the night this is a very dark kind of melancholy novel and it's dealing with neoliberal politics and the effect that it's had on Iceland um the quotas of fishing and the destruction of small towns through the um insider trading and the corrupt government um and how that's affected Iceland and their small towns and people who are from these rural isolated communities that no longer have access to their traditional uh, sources of income um, and also with the toxic masculinity pervasive in Icelandic society and the effect that that has on women especially when things like financial difficulties occur um, so <laughs> it is about violence against women um, which happens very sort of slowly and insidiously and then comes with a big punch at the end I think the way that it deals with that is done really well um, it is about mental health uh, mental health in Iceland uh, and I think yeah it's very much slow moving and you don't quite realize what's happening until something massive you don't quite realize what's happening until all of a sudden it's kind of comes crashing down around you um it's a very like close novel with very few characters um but a lot built into it i will say i think it's slightly missold because it talks about spanning the 20th century of iceland but the historic element is not really there because whilst it does talk about people from previous times and it does from the previous generations in this family it doesn't really build up any sense that this is not the same time period except that the economic realities are different um but so because of that and because of the um really relentless melancholy of this book i didn't feel for it quite the way i did about summer light and then comes the night because whilst that was also dark and weird and twisty and dealing with similar political things it also had whimsy and humor to it that i think was missing from this so um not my favorite but I did enjoy it and it's always interesting to read translated fiction for that vlog i also read the wonder by emma donahue uh this one's quite well known and it is a piece of historical fiction from emma donahue and since the last book i read of hers the pull of the stars was also historical fiction i had quite high hopes for this it is about an english nurse who goes to ireland um and she's tasked with sitting up with this girl who has said she hasn't eaten for four months um and the local doctor is trying to prove that this is a miracle um but 
our nurse Lib is very suspicious um, and she comes in to try and prove it basically um, and to see what sinister what things are actually going on in this small Irish community. I think that Emma Donoghue did a really great job of evoking the time period and of evoking rural Ireland at this time. This is set in the 1860s so we are just a few years post famine um, in this novel and she really does a good job of evoking sort of a traditional Irish way of life um, and of the uh, countryside I think she does a really brilliant job with that also the characters are really well fleshed out and feel really believable the way they talk um, and the way that Catholicism is woven so deeply with superstition um, and with kind of pre-Christian ideas there is a lot of like paganist things that are woven into the kind of Catholic spirit spirituality of Ireland um, in a way that gives it an added mysticism. I really enjoyed the characters and I thought they were really warm and beautiful and the more I got into this novel the more I was drawn in. Um, I would say however that at the start I was finding it a little eye-rolly. Um, our English nurse has some very very obviously prejudiced ideas about Ireland and I and about Catholicism in general and I thought that they were a little bit heavy-handed like I know of course that at this time viewing Irish people as backward lazy stupid was prevalent um, but I felt like in our intelligent nurse who was supposed to be so sympathetic it felt a little over the top um, and there was also a firebrand Irish journalist who whose response to it felt a little again on the nose and over the top like they just felt a bit too obvious um, and not enough nuance given to these views of Ireland and the writing itself I didn't feel had the same beauty as the pull of the stars um, the pull of the stars I gave four stars and this I don't think would be far behind that but there were I think it was it just took its time to get going and also no spoilers but the ending wasn't my favorite I, I liked this book uh, and it was a very easy read but um, it didn't live up to the pull of the stars for me then I also read how to slowly kill yourself and others in America by Casey Lehman uh, and this is a collection of essays or memoir essays I guess personal essays is the way that you would describe them um, it's a very short book there are only a few essays in here and they, it talks about growing up in Jackson Mississippi as a black boy it talks about addiction addiction in his family it talks about black masculinity and the misogyny in black masculinity in America and it also talks about hip-hop pop culture and the commodification of pop culture and uh, the emergence of southern hip-hop so there's a lot in here um the cultural references are obviously very different from my own um and so so i didn't necessarily have that resonance of recognition with them what i loved about heavy by case Lehman was the strength of the writing and the vulnerability i feel like this novel did not quite lean as hard into the vulnerability although there are aspects of confessional i guess in this it doesn't feel as open to me as a reader um the writing is still stunning wonderful beautiful um but it did feel very much more american uh much less universal much more american focused um and i guess it is about how to slowly kill yourself and others in america um but uh, that is kind of where it lost me i think that heavy focus much more in on layman's life and that allowed it to have universality universality whereas this is very much american focused um and so didn't quite reach out to me in the same way still as i said an incredibly written book um and layman is a very talented writer but this one didn't quite work for me as much as the other one did then another book that i read i read net galley proof of against white feminism by Raffia Zakaria and I really enjoyed this book I think it's one that I will have to read again so Raffia Zakaria worked for the UN uh, and this book is as it says on the tin about white feminism it is specifically posed against a kind of western centric imperialist uh, neoliberal white feminism middle class white feminism I suppose um, a, a white feminism that is very much like sex positive choice focused uh and doesn't have a class analysis or racial analysis involved at all it is very well written and it goes through multiple different aspects and it i like what i really liked about this book that i have struggled with with some of the other feminist race-based political literature that i have read recently is that they are very much focused in the country that they are in so they're very american or they're very british this felt a lot more global and i think that rafia zakaria is a pakistani writer or a writer of pakistani extraction um and so that i think probably helped but i really appreciated the class analysis that was really evident in this book and class not just as in um economic class but as in 
people as a class. Um, there's definitely a Marxist slant to this analysis and I think it was really well done. Zachariah used her own experience, her own experience of university um, and her own experience of the UN to talk about her experience with white feminism. Like white women come first um, and once we've dealt with that we can deal with you. It talks about the beginning, the coining of the term intersexuality by Kimberly Crenshaw and it also talks about the things that I didn't know about like the political history of the term empowerment um, and how that comes from a feminist uh, a feminist of colour and of the global south perspective. Um, so yeah it really fired me up, it's one that I want to read again uh, and I really appreciated the kind of more global slant of this and the pointing out of the inadequacies of um, feminism from white feminism going into other cultures and also of charity and the way that for example the Gates Foundation buying people chickens is really useless um, and I just found that I was kind of angry and also I really yeah I thought this was really well done um, a lot more a lot less individualistic than some of the other feminist texts I have read which is exactly what she's talking about so yeah I would definitely recommend this one if you're into feminism at all. Then I also read The Intoxicating Mr Lavelle by Neil Blackmore. Uh, this is historical fiction set in the 18th century which is something that I've been wanting to read more of for a long time. This is about two brothers who are from this very small insular family who built its wealth in trade but whose parents want him and his brother to get a um, to get on in life and to get to know good people. People with wealth and inheritance and titles and things. And so they decide to go on a grand tour as men did as a coming of age at this time um, and meet people that way. And they've been brought up by their mother with a interest in the enlightenment and science and art um, and a certain specific understanding of those things. On tour one of these brothers meets Mr Lavelle who is charming and seductive and kind of destroys one of the brothers ideas about art and about people of quality ideas that he was already already wavering on. Uh, this is also a queer novel um, a queer historical fiction novel which is what I believe what Neil Blackmore generally writes uh, historical fiction about gay men that's kind of his thing and um, this was this was good this was uh, it evoked the time period really well. The characters are really deep, they, I could really understand their motivations. Um, it was a little melodramatic, but I feel like that is in a tradition of melodrama, like of 18th century melodrama. Like I feel like there was a connection to that literary past. There were a lot of references in here, not all that I got, I'm not an art historian, um, but I feel like that the part of melodrama, part of the ending of this book was a reference to melodrama and melodrama as part of the gay literary canon as well um so i thought that it was doing that quite well yeah it was very entertaining it was very predictable i knew exactly what was going to happen um and so i wouldn't necessarily consider it to be one of my favorite novels it's although it does deal with darkness and darker themes essentially it's a light frothy melodrama um and so it's not something that really stuck with me for the heart of it um it's very much like scandal um but it's a good scandal, it's a good romp, um, it's a good fun historical novel with a little bit more underpinning it than you would necessarily get in others and it was well researched which is something that, well, it seemed well researched. I'm not a historian of this time period, maybe there are a lot of inadequacies but the thing that I struggle with is stuff that's blatantly ahistorical. Um, this felt in the spirit of the time even if it's not necessarily 100% correct but I enjoyed it. Then I vlogged a lot of my reading this month um, so another vlog that I did was for the Women in Translation readathon and again I will leave that vlog linked in the cards above if you are interested and for that vlog I read Cartelin Street by Magda Zabo which was translated from the Hungarian by Len Rix. Uh, this is set in Hungary in Budapest um, and it is about three families who live on the same street, Kartilin Street. They live there in the 1940s um, but something happens in 1944 to one of the family, the Helds, the Jewish family. It tears, apart, it tears apart these three families and changes the trajectory of their lives forever. We flash forward to them living in the 1950s and 60s in Budapest, uh, moved to a Soviet tenement block and their experience of life under Soviet rule as well as Nazi rule and also pre-Nazi rule. It seems like it would be a really heavy novel but there is such a lightness and a dreamlike quality to this prose. It is so simply written but in such a beautiful way. Um, all of the characters are lightly evoked in that it takes a very short amount of time for Zabo to really 
um, enmesh their character and for you to understand who they are. She does a really great job of hinting at things, of allowing you to read between the lines in a way that makes it clear what's going on without making it um, blatant what's going on. It's really beautifully done. Um, the themes of watched being watched of surveillance of the themes of being watched and surveillance um the magic realist elements of the ghost of one of the characters who haunts the others through their lives and we kind of see things through her perspective which gives this really dreamlike uh disconnected quality to the prose the darkness is there it is but it's always kind of a shadow rather than the preeminent force everything that terrible that happens happens off the page and yet we still feel so much of it um again it's a very melancholy novel which i think i've talked about in some of the others but it does so without melodrama it's very stripped and bare and it does a really good job of making you feel like you understand a little bit of budapest under soviet rule and it does that through a very close focus on a family um rather than on big events we see the changes in their relationships and the changes in themselves through the course of this novel and it's really really well done i would 100 percent recommend this one i also read consent a memoir by vanessa Spin springura and this is as the title says a memoir of a vanessa's adolescence when she was groomed by a very famous man in the french literary circles and how this was allowed to be happen her mother allowed it because of the permissive ideas about sex at the time um the campaigns to lower the age of consent for example eliding power dynamics when it came to choice um and also because of his power as a famous literary person that people didn't want to he, he was, it was kind of a, a known secret that he was a paedophile it's a very short memoir but at the same time does pack a lot in um it does a good job if you are concerned i was concerned before i read this novel that i wouldn't be able to handle it and i'm not saying that it would be handleable for everyone but i am saying it does a good job of allowing you to understand what's going on complete disgust <laughs> about what's going on without it being too visceral or descriptive in any way it doesn't feel voyeuristic and i suppose that's because this is her life she allows you in just as much as she can and i think that makes it more readable than something that goes a bit further could be talks not just about their individual relationship but also the ways in which society failed them the ways in which police got close to uncovering things and just ignored it um the way that he was still invited on to famous television shows etc throughout it reminded me kind of of jimmy savile and that kind of thing known secrets um and how things are allowed to perpetuate um the writing itself very sparse not a lot to it not my favorite style but um, I find it very hard to like rate a person's life uh, that feels odd to me so the writing was competent and I got across this point um, but it didn't sparkle in the way that I know some people have really loved this book and for me I thought it was it was good and well done well executed executed but I could have I could have had more uh, analysis which I think is not what you're going to get from someone who's like the first-hand experience of this so I thought it was very well done the way that it uh, dealt with her reactions afterwards of realizing what had been done to her the ambivalence of her position of her feeling like she wasn't being groomed because that's what grooming does to you um yeah I think it did well handling that aspect of it but later the, the societal stuff felt a little like it could have more analysis and perhaps that's something that would have to come from someone who wasn't like so close to it I also read Revenge by Yoko Ogawa. Uh, this is a collection of short stories that are all kind of interlinked and are fairly mundane but with uh, an element of the dark and the macabre going on underneath. Um, some things a little bit creep definitely creepy and sometimes I think feel either surreal or potentially supernatural. This wasn't for me. Um, I could see where she was going. I could appreciate the dark tone because I like that in a short story but this didn't have any fun or whimsy or any joy to it it was very very bland and very very flat um and that's not my style at all it also didn't have enough darkness to warrant the lack of whimsy um I just feel like the writing was so boring that it really ruined it for me <laughs> all of these characters were un- all of these characters were unexceptional and i get that's what yoko Gar was kind of doing is these are very unexceptional kind of the mundane characters in life and their experiences that are weird um but the weirdness just didn't pack a punch after a while because i was like your weirdness is the same throughout every single story it's just the same you're like oh yeah okay cool uh, and the next one oh it's the same that's great um yeah it felt very repetitive and really really 
boring and underwhelming. So this was not for me. I struggled to get through it and it's tiny. So um, I know that Yoko Ogawa has a lot of fans. Um, I think I might still read The Housekeeper and The Professor, but I'm definitely not going to read The Memory Police because I've heard such mixed reviews and I already know she's boring. I also read Negatives of a Group Photograph by um, Azita, by Azita Garuman and Maura Dooley, which is a collection of poetry. Um, Azita Garuman is an Iranian poet and it they were uh, political and love poetry, poetry about family. Um, and I really, really enjoyed reading that. Um, there was a, this was by the Poetry Translation Centre and there was a whole introductory thing. There was a whole introductory chapter about translation and the way that it worked between the two poets um the way that they worked to find the right word because of the way because poetry is so about the connotations of all the words um all of the words are specifically chosen for their resonances and those things don't essentially easily translate and i thought that that introduction was fascinating i also thought a lot of the poetry was really beautiful i really enjoyed it maura dooley was my mentor when i did my uh creative and life writing masters um so i have worked with her on my poetry and um, I already knew I loved her poetry so uh, I guess I was in safe hands going in since she was the one to m take the translation and turn it into poetry um, but yeah I thought it was really interesting and a lot of really beautiful writing. I also read Blackwater Sister by Zen Cho for that uh, first vlog that I talked about um, reading fantasy books by Asian authors and this is set in Malaysia and it is about a girl Jess who goes to Malaysia um, because her parents are experiencing financial difficulties and they get a job back in Penang um, and as she goes back she starts hearing the voice of her ama, her maternal grandmother. She becomes enmeshed with the Blackwater sister who is one of the lesser gods in Malaysia, Ama's past uh, and the revenge, the reason that she's still wandering as a as a hungry ghost. This one was another one that was on my anticipated releases lists. It sounded like involved in Malaysian folklore uh, and folklore is something that I'm really interested in reading about um, and I thought it would be a kind of dark and mysterious wasn't that. I really didn't enjoy the writing style of this. I thought it was very colloquial and very much used just to push the plot along. This is a very plot heavy book where a lot happens um, and the writing itself is not beautiful in any way and it's not really conducive to me wanting to read more. It just feels very as if you were describing a story to someone rather than actually being a written novel. The characters themselves had no depth, they were very flat. The mystery I figured out like 20% of the way in the book and so the mystery itself didn't hold any interest for me anymore. It felt written like some of the YA that I've read. I know that Zencho does write YA so I think potentially that is why but I felt like it didn't have enough cultural detail, it didn't have enough historical detail, it didn't have and everything just felt a little like a cartoon in terms of characterization, in terms of plot, everything just felt a little like Hanna-Barbera characters running really fast. Um, so yeah, this one really wasn't for me. Um, I know a lot of people have talked about it, but it didn't work for me. <sighs> and just one more book, I promise. I know this video is incredibly long. Um, I think the longest of my wrap ups ever, but I've read a lot of books this month, I'm sorry. <laughs> The final book I read is She Who Became the Sun by Shelley Parker Chan and this is a historical fantasy set in China in the 14th century about the rise of the Ming Dynasty and the fall of the Mongols uh, in China. It follows a girl who is told that she will never amount to anything and her brother has a great destiny before him but when her brother dies she decides to take over his identity. This one also didn't have writing that was particularly beautiful or that I particularly liked and it was also very plot heavy but I don't know if it's because the characters were more fleshed out in this. I felt like I really understood them and their drives and their desires um, and I liked the characterization. or if it's just because I'm a sucker for anything historical and I'm really intrigued by this time period because it's again not a time period I know very much about which is always what I want in historical fiction. Um, I thought that the time period was lightly evoked but it still felt historical um, which I enjoy and although it didn't have particularly beautiful writing it did have some level of description that I feel was entirely missing from like Water Sister. Um, so this was fun. For me this was just a lot of fun. A very easy read, a very quick read um, but it was one that I enjoyed. It reminded me a lot of the Across the Nightingale Floor trilogy by Leanne Hearn um, that I read when I was a teenager. Absolutely loved that trilogy uh, and I know that was set in Japan and a fantasy Japan and this is set in kind of a fantasy China so they're not the same but in terms of the style of writing, in terms of the characters and their motivations it felt very similar. Um, 
with enough historical accurate with enough historical content and enough enmeshedness of the fantasy the ghosts in blackwater sister just feel like supernatural beings who can do whatever they want this felt much more like not realistic but believable and i could suspend my disbelief for this book in the way i couldn't for blackwater sister so whilst it may not become my favorite novel of all time uh, and i think there are probably going to be sequels i think um i definitely enjoyed reading this more than the other than the other one and so yeah if you want a bit of a fun historical fiction don't expect great writing but if you are looking for that then i think this could be the one okay, this one i've popped in just before the end because i've just finished filming and then realized i hadn't talked about this one i also read death on the nile by agatha christie which is a poirot novel about a murder of an heiress on the nile uh it's one of the longer Poirot novels I believe. I listened to it whilst we drove to Cornwall and back from Cornwall with my partner um, so it was very much on the road the whole time and it's one of those Poirots that I already knew because I'd seen adaptations of it uh, but it was still good fun um, and I still didn't remember all of the like red herrings and all of the ways that other things interconnected other people got wrapped up um, so whilst I knew what the actual murder who the murderers were um, I still had fun with the rest of it for that and it was still quite funny um Agatha Christie writing a socialist very funny I would say it's a bit long could could have used a little editing um and not enough he and no hastings so I missed him um but essentially I always enjoy a poire so so yes uh that was an incredibly long video we've nearly lost all of the light um I read a lot of books this month some of them great some of them I really didn't like but uh let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of these I would love to hear what you thought of them um and if you haven't read any of them what was your favorite book you read this month please remember to give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and to subscribe I put out new videos every Thursday and Sunday at 5 p.m so I will be back again very soon thank you for watching bye, -bye.